let's start chapter nine tonight. And let's talk about primitives versus objects. The book is actually pretty good on this. And so rather than me having to redraw all of the diagrams, I'm going to follow the book on this. We've been talking about int, double char, and Boolean. And these are what are called primitive types. And this memory is stored directly. So when I have int number becomes negative two and symbol is assigned the exclamation point, you can think of the symbol number or the name, variable name number, directly storing the value negative two. The variable name symbol directly stores the exclamation point. When we have arrays, and objects like strings, that's not the way they work. Again, they are by reference. So if I have an array of characters with C, A, and T, this is what the memory diagram looks like. Here's our my variable name, and the variable name contains a reference to that array of characters. And I guess it might be a good idea to go into J shell right here at the moment. So if I say character... Um, what do they call it here? Array, okay. I don't know why they used an array of char, but okay, fine. We'll, we'll go with it. And now I say system.out.println of array. Okay, dang. That did not do what I want because unfortunately... Um, print line does special stuff with characters. Let's make an integer array. Oh, hello, I need an equal sign. Okay, there we go. You know what, I think we're going to have a problem because I think J shell is, is getting in our way. Nope, it isn't. Okay. This is what we were talking about before. It's a reference. This square bracket means we have an array. The I means it's integer. And the at sign gives us the uh, address in memory. I knew that I shouldn't have used characters as my example. Strings work the same way. So if I have string word is assigned dog, word is a reference to memory somewhere. And somewhere in memory, in fact, the area that it's in is called the heap. Somewhere in the heap is the string dog. And we can usually create them with the new keyword, which allocates memory for them. We did that here, in fact. Well, I didn't do that before. So let's go back to J shell. And I can say, for example, integer array um, numbers is a new integer array of length five. And that creates five values, all which happen to be initialized to zero. And it says here, when you want to compare strings for equality, you need the equals method. And let me show you why that is the case, by the way. For example, let's say I have string. I think I may have done this before. String one is going to be a new string. And now I say string str2 is another new string. These happen to be in different areas of memory. So if I say, is string one the same reference as string two, the answer is false. Because there are two copies of the word dog. That's why I need to use the equals method. To compare the things they refer to not the references themselves. Um, when you declare an object, normally we've been assigning it a reference to some value. For example, here I had a new integer of five. Earlier, when I think I had um, array, it had three integers in it. It turns out that when you have strings and arrays and other objects, you can declare a variable that doesn't refer to any object at all, at least initially. And that's with the null value. And let's use this example here. Let's have a string name and we're gonna say no value yet. 
and we're going to have an integer array called combo that has the value null. To show you that it really doesn't have a value is what if I try, okay, well, let's go back and um, remember if I had string str1, what was this, str1? Because there is a value, I can look at string one dot length. But since name does not have any value at all, if I try and get the name of something that's null, I'll get the dreaded null pointer exception. I can't get the length of something that has not never been given any value. I can't, for example, say system.out.println of combo sub zero. Why? Because there is no zeroth element. There's no elements at all. And again, I get a null pointer exception on that. Um, sometimes we can pass them as an argument or receive one as a return value. And we usually will do that if we want to represent a special condition or indicate an error. The person who first invented null references, by the way, um, characterizes it as his million dollar mistake because there have been so many software programs that have gotten these null pointer exceptions where you're trying to do something and there's really no value to use. And repairing all those bugs he figures has cost a billion dollars. So I'm not thrilled with people using null indiscriminately. If you do want to use null and pass it as an argument or return it as a value from a method, be very careful about what you're doing and document it in a comment. Other languages, by the way, have better ways of handling error conditions rather than using null to represent an error. Um, but unfortunately, Java cannot take advantage of those newer, more I don't know if I want to say secure, newer, more robust methods of doing it. But that's a, that would be getting, I could go into detail, but that would be getting us way off of chapter nine. Okay, strings are immutable. Um, oh yeah, if we didn't have a string class, we'd have to use arrays of characters to store and manipulate text. And there are languages like that. C, by the way, is one of them. And let's just say it's a mess to manipulate strings in languages that don't have a built-in string class. So we are very glad that Java has that available. Yeah. Now, again, I think I mentioned this before, very, very important. When we have this two lowercase and two uppercase, it makes you think that it changes the value, but it doesn't. And let's go and um, do this example here. So if I have string name, this time I'm going to give it that. And then I'm gonna string upper name becomes name dot two uppercase. We're gonna use the uppercase method and invoke it with name as the object that we want to mop, um, transform. Upper name is Alan Turing, but name is still exactly the way it was before. Again, strings are immutable. And now this is the thing that I get from everybody when I talk about this. They say, okay, well, here I've got a string metal. I'm going to say metal becomes lead. And then I say metal becomes gold. Didn't I just change the string? And the answer is no, you did not change lead into gold. Yeah. What's happening is this first assignment, here's the memory diagram. Metal refers to someplace out on the heap with the word lead inside of it. When you have the second assignment, we change the reference. So the reference is now referring to an area of the heap with the letters G-O-L-D, the word gold in it. The string lead is still on the heap. It has not been modified. Nobody's referring to it anymore. It's still out there though. And there's a process called the garbage collector that will go through in the Java virtual machine and get rid of and reclaim the memory from 
data that is no longer being referred to by anybody else. So the question is, what do we mean when we say changing the string? Well, here's what we could do in some other languages. I could say metal is assigned gold, and then I could change element number zero of the string to the letter S. But Java won't let you do that because the string itself is not modifiable. However, if I do want to change the word gold to sold, I can create a brand new string, which is the letter S, and then the rest of the letters for metal, and then reassign it to metal. That's okay. Again, I'm doing a reassignment. I'm not changing the original. I'm creating a brand new string and reassigning the reference to refer to this new string that I have just constructed. And this is a distinction that really does make a difference. Um, so strings are immutable. Okay, wrapper classes. Primitives are not objects. So if I say int i becomes five, I cannot do something like this. The compiler will complain. Let's just check that out to make sure that that's the case. And then I want to say i dot equals five. And the answer is int cannot be dereferenced. Int isn't a reference, it's, it's, it's a primitive value. So for each of these primitive types, we have a wrapper class. That's W-R-A-P-P-E-R, -P -P -E not R-A-P-P-E-R, -P -P -E as in musician. And the wrapper class for int is named integer with a capital T. With a capital I, excuse me. Hello. <laughs> what was I say? Well, I don't know where that came from. Now notice that this is a capital I integer. I becomes integer dot value of five. What this will do is it will take the value five, which is an int, a primitive, and wrap it up into an object. And now I have an actual object. And now I can say, is that equal to five? In fact, let's do this here as capital I integer, and all to make it clear, let's call it int object is integer dot value of five. And now I can do integer object equals five, and everything is going to work out fine. Because again, I now have an object. I don't have a primitive anymore. And there's capital B Boolean for Booleans, capital C character for char variables, capital D double and capital L long, which correspond to the primitives, small b Boolean, small c char, small d double and small L long. And you don't have to import them. They're automatically available. And these um, objects are immutable, so you have to use the equals method to compare them. This creates two different objects. So if I try and compare their references, that's false. But if I say, do they have the same value? That's true. And also, by the way, these wrapper classes, they're very nice. You can find out the minimum and maximum value for an integer. So, for example, what's the long dot max value? Is this gigantic number here? Long dot minimum value. How about double dot max value? Is 1.7 times 10 to the 308th. And 90% of the time, you'll want to go with the regular primitives, int, char, double, and long. However, so the question is, well, why in the hell do we have this stuff anyway? And the reason we have these is because 
later on, and I'll put this in my notes here today. Yeah. So why wrapper classes? Answer. Later on this semester, and a lot in computer science 76, we will be using classes that require you to have objects when you build them. One of them this semester, by the way, if I could type it correctly, is the array list class. Okay. You can't build an array list of int, but you can build an array list of capital I integer. And that's why we have these wrapper classes. We have them for those situations where Java requires an object and a primitive simply will not do. Okay. We've seen that value of takes a primitive integer and returns a wrapped object. The question is, how do we go the opposite direction? So I have capital integer, int object becomes integer dot value of, let's say, well, 123, fine. So we use value of to um, convert a primitive int to an object integer. I'm sorry, I'm having so much trouble typing tonight. So go the opposite direction. You use the int value method. So I could say um, int primitive value would become int object dot int value. And in fact, let's try that out in the shell here. And then I should be able to say int primitive value becomes int object dot int value. And I get back my primitive value. Now, this is the way we used to have to do this. We had to do this all the time. Every time we wanted to make sure we had an integer object, we had to do a value of, or we had to create a brand new um, integer, capital I integer with the new keyword. And then every time we had this object and we needed the primitive value, we had to make a call to int value. Boy, what a mess that was. Turns out that we no longer need to do that. This is how we can do it explicitly. There's nothing wrong with doing it explicitly if you want to. Okay, so seeding to um, statements are explicit conversions. Turns out that Java is very smart. And now, and I'm not sure when it was introduced, but I think around Java 8 maybe, will do what is called auto box and auto unbox values so you don't have to go through all the trouble so i can say integer int object becomes 123 and then the primitive will be auto boxed into an integer object and if i say int primitive value becomes integer object then the object will be auto unboxed into a primitive value. And in fact, let's copy this and, and it works exactly the same. So definitely take advantage of auto boxing and auto unboxing. They will save you a lot of trouble 
when you have to deal with um, these things in the context where Java actually requires an object. Okay, what is the next topic here? Command line arguments, I'm gonna come back to that later, I think. I'm not gonna talk about big integer arithmetic. I'm going to let you read about this on your own. I'm not going to cover it in the mini lectures. Um, it's important. It's, it's good to know, but let's leave that for a later point. I'll come back to command line arguments perhaps later this evening or maybe tomorrow. Let's go to the other book, though, and see what else it has to do. I do want to talk about, okay, methods in the scanner class. Please read this section on your own. If you have any questions and you want me to talk about it later on in another mini lecture, you know, send me an email and let me know. And this is dealing with some of the minutia of, of Java itself. How does Java itself work? And really what we want to do is we want to talk about big concepts in this course, like what are objects? What's a loop? Um, how do I do selection? If else, that kind of stuff. But every once in a while, we have to deal with the inner workings and the little details and some things that will come up when you're generalizing and modularizing your code. And so if you're going to hit, basically what I'm telling you is this, when you generalize a method for doing input, don't create a scanner inside of a method. So if I have a method for getting input, in fact, here, let's, let's do this real quick. Um, I may as well go through it. Okay, well, let's go through it. Since I'm talking about it, <laughs> in for a penny, in for a pound. So let's call this scanner details.java. Okay. And this is show that scanner has some things you have to watch out for. Namely, don't recreate scanners if you can help it. So let's say I do something like this, public static int get positive number. And here I'll say scanner input is new scanner of um, system.in. And I need to put up a prompt. Do I want this to be a do while loop? Sure, why not? Then I'm going to say n becomes um, input.nextint. If n is less than or equal to zero, and do that as long as n is less than or equal to zero, and then I'll return n. There we go. I think that's rather nice. And then here I'm going to do something like um, integer number one is going to be get positive number. And number two is going to be do get positive number. And then we'll have a double average becomes num1 plus num2 plus number three divided by 3.0. Um, oh goodness, what happened here? Illegal start of expression. Oh yeah, I left a blank between the less than and equal sign. <sighs> How about printf? 
Excellent. So now I'm going to execute if there's a negative 3. Find 7, 5, and 22. Average is 11.33. Oh, see? Hey, well, where's the problem? Lovely. Everything works like a champ. Except for one problem. Somebody's going to say, hey, here you close your input. First of all, I'm creating a scanner here, which I never use, which is sort of weird. And I close it here. Well, now I'm creating a scanner every single time that I call this method. So problem one. And there's some overhead involved. It's, it's, it's a bit ugly. Problem two. Uh, if I close the scanner inside this method, Oh boy, am I in trouble. So somebody will say, oh, you didn't close your scanner. Oh, wow, that's right, you say. And you do input.close. There, problem solved. And now let's run it. If I say enter number five, and all of a sudden it says no such element exception. And the reason is because once you close a scanner, you can no longer open it again which means I can't open a connection to the keyboard twice in a program. I've already closed it and I'm out of luck. So let's save this as scanner details better, or let's call it, um, correct.java and what this time I'm going to do is I am going to create the scanner here in main that's perfectly okay and I'm going to pass it on here now I don't have to declare it and I don't have to close it either I'm going to close the scanner once I'm completely finished with it at the end of the program. And every time I want a positive number, I'm going to pass in this a reference to this scanner that I've already created. create and accidentally close them. And now I have five. 7, 28, and now it still works. So this is just a, a, a heads up about what happens when you're passing a, when you have a scanner and you want to do input from a method several times, pass the scanner in, do not create new scanners every time. And since this is now correct, I don't have the problems anymore. So let me change my comment here. my parameters so I'm free to use it. The method that called me will take care of creating and closing it. I won't do it here. Yeah, that's much better. And the next thing I want to talk about is the software development cycle. So this is our two-step cycle when we've been writing programs so far. You write it and you test it. If it doesn't work, you go back to step one, try writing again. 
There's actually a step zero here, by the way, which is plan the damn code, but let's, we're, let's leave that out for right now. A lot of the planning has been done for you. When I write up the assignment, most of the assignment tells you what the plan is because it tells you what things you need to do. But we've got to write and test. That's, that's our cycle so far. Yeah. The software development cycle has a lot of different definitions, and I've seen some with five steps, some with as many as 10, but they all have the idea that there's more than just writing and testing, writing and testing until you get what you want. So this is a very nice seven-step definition. What's the problem you're trying to solve, and what does the customer want the program to do? You would be surprised how many times I've seen people write programs and they don't have an idea of what they really want it to do when it grows up. And that is not a recipe for success. So you try to say, why are we using a computer in the first place? Maybe this is a problem that could be better solved by hand or by some other process. And again, what does the customer want? Once we know what the customer wants and what problem we're trying to solve, now we can say, okay, what does the program actually need to do? How do we solve the problem using a computer? And or and you'll have to talk to the end users. So you're just going to ask them, okay, well, do you want this, for example, dialog boxes if we're using a web application? Or would you rather have, you know, free text or, you know, like, if, here's an example. If you're going to enter the month, do you want to be entering it by a month, by a number, or by a drop-down menu with the names of the months January through December? Which do you prefer? Okay. So that's the kind of thing that would happen in system analysis and design. So now that you know what that is, you can go to your third step, which is system design. And now you develop the data structures and the methods that you need to do the tasks that the application is supposed to perform. And you write this all down. You haven't really started coding yet. That's in the development phase. Okay, then we do testing to see if the program works the way you said the requirements have. And this is best done by a group of people who did not write the code. So the developers are the worst people to do the testing. When you do testing, you want actual users of the program or you want someone else. Okay, this isn't again in a large project. For the assignments here, you are both the <laughs> you're you're the designer, you're the writer, and you're also the user, all three at once. And then you're also going to be the person who's testing things. Okay, after you've tested and you've gotten rid of the bugs that you know about. Then it's time to deploy the program, send it out to the end users. Now, guarantee that they will find things that you did not find, which means we are going to have bug fixes and feature enhancements. And say, well, either something doesn't work or, gosh, this works great, but can you make it do something extra? Or, yeah, gosh, this works, but it seems a little bit too difficult. Can you make it easier for us to do that? At every one of these stages, we may have to go back earlier and earlier. For example, during testing, we might find out that we have done something. Yeah, we're satisfying the requirements, but our algorithm is way too slow. And that means we have to go actually back to step, to step three here, saying we need a different method to solve this problem because the one we first decided on was too slow to work to our user, user satisfaction. Um, sometimes the users during testing um, will say, you know, th this is not what we had in mind at all. So we might have to go back to step two or even all the way back to step one. They're saying, yeah, this is nice, so nice. It's great, great at solving a problem, but it's not a problem that we ever encounter. So who cares? <laughs> So be aware that this is the software development life cycle. And um, there, I believe somewhere later on, there's a discussion assignment that where you're going to be writing about that.
let's see what's back here. Uh, do I want to talk about command line arguments? Sure. Okay. Right now, we've been using the integrated development environment to do all of our um, writing of the programs and running them. There are other ways to do it. You can do this from the command line. Okay, this is sort of advanced stuff. I don't think it's going to show up on the exam, but it's useful. It's interesting to know, and that's why I'm talking about it. Namely, we're going to figure out what this string args does. So let's say what I want to do here is I'm going to pass some command lines. We want to find the maximum value in a sequence of numbers. So let's copy this. And let's open up our template. Well, let me see what this says it's supposed to do. Find the maximum value. Okay, cool. Let me just paste this in here so I can see what's different here. We're not going to use a scanner in this case. And we're going to need here. Oh, how to use the command line to get arguments from the user. Now let's compile that to make sure that compiles. Now, the problem is if I run it, it's not going to do what I want eventually. So let me show you how we're going to run this from the command line. And let's do an ls to list all my files. You'd use a different command if you were in Windows, by the way. Well, that's interesting. Excuse me, I need to figure out where I put it. Oh, lovely. I have been storing all of these in the wrong directory. So excuse me for a moment while I fix that. Okay, there, now they're in the right place. Um, so if I list my files, you'll notice I have max.java and it turns out I also have max.class. That is the Java bytecode. And so now I can say, let's go and run Java and I wanna use the max program. And what it'll do is it will show us all the arguments. What I wanna be doing, here's what I want as a result. What I wanna be able to do is I wanna be able to print out things like three, eight, 22, 117, and I want to get the maximum of those. In fact, as long as I've got this, this is perfect. I may as well do it here. And you'll notice that here I have this array. Now, these are strings. They aren't numbers. They're actual strings in here. I can put anything I want here, in fact. I am having so much trouble typing tonight. Mm -hmm. So whatever I put after the name of my program, that goes into the args array. And there are a bunch of strings. Okay, cool. Now that I know that, what I can say here is, I want my maximum value. And I'm going to set it to be integer dot minimum value. And that guarantees that everything I look at will be bigger. Now what I'm going to say is for int i is 0, i is less than args.length, i++. Plus plus. My plan is to convert arg sub i from a string to an int, and then compare it to the maximum value. If it's greater, 
that becomes the new maximum value. Now the question is how do I take a string and convert it to an integer? And the answer is there's a there's a method for that. So I can say integer value becomes integer dot parse int r sub i. So what we'll do is it will take each of the values arg sub i and parse it as an integer and that will convert it to an int. Then if the value is greater than the maximum value, that becomes the new maximum value. And when I'm done with my loop, Let's compile that. Now, how would I compile that from the command line? The answer is I would say Java compiler, Java C, max.java. Notice it gave me no output. That means everything was great. Let me show you what happens if I make some sort of an error in here like this. Uh, that's interesting. Did I save this? Yes, I did. Uh, hold on a second while I look. I'm going to pause the recording for a second. Sorry, I had the I had it in the wrong folder here. Let's do again. Java C Max Java, and there I got my error message. So let's go back here. Put that back. And compile it. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, looks like it's time for me to look up what the minimum value is. I could have sworn it was, I wonder if it was val or value. Well, let's find out here. It's min value, not min val. Save the file here. This is what we used to have to do, by the way, before integrated development environments came along. And now let's try Java Max with 10 to 4, uh, 66, 47, and 11. And the maximum value is 66. So that's a brief view of how you can read strings from the command line those are going to be in the args array. Those are the arguments that are going to your program. You can convert them using parse int. If we had had floating point numbers, we would have used capital D double dot parse double. And then you can do whatever you want with those arguments. So nice to know, I guess. It's in the book and that's why I am talking about it. Um, I'm going to skip big, big, big integer arithmetic completely. Incremental design, you might want to, look, again, read this one on your own. Read 9.8 and 9.9. .9. If you have questions, send me them in Canvas, and I will address them tomorrow. Otherwise, what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to head straight on to, X, um, to chapter 10. And the reason I'm doing that is because I'm not going to be available um, next week, Monday and Tuesday. So I want to get a head start on chapter 11, which is a really important one on Wednesday and Thursday. So my plan is to talk about chapter 10 here um, tomorrow. And maybe a little bit of Wednesday, but Wednesday and Thursday, I'll be able to start talking more about uh, Chapter 11. See you tomorrow.